All right, the developing brain. Here's what we're going to look. We're going to look at the brain. We're going to look at parental environmental influences in the developing brain, media influences, and spiritual influences. The human brain is, is composed of over 100 billion neurons or nerve cells with over 1 trillion supporting cells. And each neuron, brain cell, can have up to 10,000 connections to other brain cells, which is 40 quadrillion interconnections. And it's really these interconnections that are what's important, not the number of gray cells, not the number of neurons that's primarily important, but the number of interconnections. The interconnections make networks for information processing. Einstein's brain was biopsied after his death, and he, per cubic centimeter, he had less neurons per cubic centimeter than the average intelligence person. But he had significantly more neuron-to-neuron -neuron connections than the average person. And it's those connections that make uh, information processing and intelligence. And you only get those connections by exercising the circuits. So if you want to have a high functioning, and we will talk about some things that interfere with this in a moment, but if you want to have high intelligence, then you have to exercise the circuits of thinking and reasoning and information processing. And the more you exercise them, then the stronger they get. One of God's design laws is the law of exertion. If you want something to get stronger, you must exercise it, because if you don't use it, you'll lose it. So if you want strong math ability, you have to work problems. You want strong music skills, you've got to practice your instrument. You want to be a person who has great capacity to love other people, you've got to actually love other people. And, their brain, and your brain will change if you do that. Your brain is soft like a banana inside a hard case, your skull, so it's vulnerable to rapid acceleration and deceleration injury, concussions, and now it's very, very big in the news after the football and military of the traumatic brain injuries that people can get, and you can get not only bruising of the brain, but shearing injuries of the brain where the, where the connecting fibers can be sheared and, and cut by a traumatic brain injury. Um, the brain weighs around three pounds, which is one to two percent of your body weight, and even though it's 1% to 2% of your body weight, it uses 20% of your body's energy. Or at least it's supposed to. A child at birth has millions of neurons more at birth than it has by the time it's born. Um, over 50% of the genes code for the human brain. That's how complex it is. So 2% to 3% of your body mass is your brain, but 50% of the genes code for the brain. Very, very complex. More than twice as many neurons are produced in fetal development than are, than are eventually used. During fetal development, there's times when there's 50,000 neurons being produced per second. You see, you, just that alone should tell you there are a series of vulnerabilities here. Zika virus, by the way, infects the neuronal progenitor cells and destroys the progenitor cells. And so if you know how any virus works, a virus infects the cell, takes over the machinery of the cell, and the cell then simply pre begins producing more of the virus instead of doing what it was supposed to do. And so these progenitor cells, which are the factories that make neurons, get taken over by the Zika virus, and they just make more Zika virus, and that's why they have these terribly microencephalic children who have these little tiny itty-bitty brains. Okay, and that's what it does. Normal, uh, from birth to eight years of age, the brain is busy killing off millions of neurons, so the child is born with millions of neurons more at birth than the child will have by the time they're eight years of age. At first, this doesn't sound too good. Some of you are thinking, I need that extra 100 million neurons. But uh, conceptualize it at Michelangelo's block of marble when Michelangelo gets it, and Michelangelo's block of marble when he's done with it. Does Michelangelo have less marble now? Less marble, but he has a masterpiece. The brain comes into the world prepared to be acted upon by environment, education, experience. Neural circuits which are firing and are exercised will expand. Neural circuits which are not being used will be pruned back and or deleted or reassigned depending on what's going on in the brain. The second wave of neurogenesis peaks in girls at 11 and boys at 12, followed by more remodeling and reshaping. You can guess what this is for. This is preparing for puberty and the differentiation of secondary sexual characteristics and relationship dynamics. White matter maturation doesn't finish until age 25, starting in the back of the brain and finishing. The last part of the brain to fully mature is the part of the brain behind your forehead where you reason and think. So early adolescence, um, when, the shown, when shown 
pictures and faces of emotions, early adolescents activate their mood circuits, their emotion circuits. Older adolescents start thinking about it, activating prefrontal cortex and reasoning it out. So young adolescents will be very emotional, moody, and impulsive, and less capable of processing their moods and making wise decisions. It's also one of the reasons why it's uh, some people, when they get married young at 17 or 18, and by the time they turn 25, they look at the person they married and go, what was I thinking? Now, seriously, you laugh at that. It happens because their brain at 17 and 18 is an adolescent brain. Their brain at 25 is an adult brain, and their perspective on the world changes. And if, they, if both weren't growing and maturing, so they could look at somebody that they're mature and, and, and value as a mature person, they look and they've married a child who didn't grow up with them, and they're not happy. So that often happens. Parental influences. Parents influence the developing brain in uh, two ways. Heredity, the genes that we give, and the environment in which they're raised. <clears throat> so if you've not heard the term epigenetics, epige epi means above, genetics the genome. And in 1957, Conrad Waddington uh, hypothesized by observing that every cell of your body has the same genes, but your skin cells are different than your brain cells, which are different than your bone cells, which are different than your retinal cells. All these cells are very different, but they have the same genes. So he hypothesized there must be some instructions in the cells above the genes telling the genes which ones to turn on and which ones to turn off in various places that we get all this different stuff going on. And he termed this epigenetics, the instructions sitting above the genes telling the genes how to express themselves. And in fact, we have documented now with our science that that's actually happening. I'm going to go through a lot of that with you right now. And when we have children, we not only pass along our gene sequences, the coded information, we pass along much of the epigenetic information, how those genes are being expressed will pass along, much of those expression changes will be passed along as well. And those epigenetic changes pass down three and four generations. Does that ring any bells for anybody? So I want you to look at these two mice and consider how closely related they may be. This is a parent and a child. Is this, uh, are these siblings of the same litter? Are these children of the same parents but not of the same litter? Um, or just members of the same species and not related at all? So this is uh, kind of giving you a, a picture of your genetics or chromosomes. So our, our DNA is a double helix, so consider it a zipper. In order to get the coded information, uh, so, it's co it's, so the DNA is stored as a zipper, double helix, together wrapped around histones, packed into chromatin, packed into chromosomes. The information you want is on this double helix. To get to that information, it has to unpack, unwind, and unzip. Does everybody follow that? Okay. So methyl groups, that's a chemical group, methyl group can attach to the DNA strand itself, and where it attaches, it locks that part of the DNA down. This would be analogous to getting a shirt tail caught in your zipper. You get a shirt tail caught in your zipper. The zipper there cannot unzip. If it can't unzip, the information is un no longer accessible. That gene is suppressed. It's no longer going to do its work. Um, you can also have various chemical tags in the histone group, either enhancing unwinding or impairing unwinding. So uh, non-coding RNA. The, uh, we've known there's RNA uh, in, the, uh, in the living organisms that is not involved in transcription and translation. If you remember your Biology 101, you've got the information, the coded information in your DNA. In order to make a protein, the RNA comes in and reads it, trans transcribes it, and then translates it to make whatever we're going to make with the ribosomes and so forth. Well, there's RNA in our body that doesn't do that. And scientists for a long time, well, they had no idea. Don't know what it does. What we do know now, though, is it actually is involved in epigenetic expression, altering how genes are being expressed. Um, it uh, can splice genetic material in, take a new gene and, and help splice it into a, a sequence of genetic information. It can modify gene expression epigenetically. Uh, in fact, it suppresses an entire chromosome, is what micro uh, non coding RNA does. Uh, women, if you know, have two X chromosomes, and a man has an X and a Y. Because you only need one X per cell, a woman will suppress one, called a bar body, where one is not active. Only one X chromosome is active per cell. Now, a woman gets an X chromosome from dad and an X chromosome from mom. Every cell in a woman's body randomly decides whether she's 
turn the one on from dad or the one on from mom. And so um, this is hypothesized to be one of the reasons why women may have more autoimmune disease because there's subtle differences in expression based on the fact that they're either expressing dad's chromosome or mom's chromosome throughout their whole body, subtle cellular differences. Additionally, um, to test this hypothesis, you guys know what color blindness is. Color, color vision is coded on the X chromosome. If you have a defective color vision chromosome, then you're colorblind. And this is why men are colorblind, and rarely are women, because men only have one X, so they get one bad copy, they're colorblind. Women get two Xs, and so they're rarely colorblind. But when they discovered that this happens randomly, they began testing individual retinal cells with laser precision um, uh, light, and they discovered that, in fact, a woman whose father is colorblind, some of her retinal cells are colorblind. Some of them turned his, his chromosome on, and, but some of them turned mom's on. So overall, her total vision is not colorblind, but she has some of her cells in her retina that are colorblind. Um, they also elongate telomeres. We will talk more about telomeres in our next talk on the aging brain. And they do DNA, DNA defenses, which means that when you get foreign genetic material spliced into your chromosomes, the uh, non-coding RNA will silence them or shut them down so they don't express themselves. So they just studied with fruit flies. They exposed the first generation of fruit flies to geldenomycin. And that group of fruit flies had these bulging outgrowths on their eyes. And then they let them reproduce. And the bulging outgrowths passed down 13 generations, even though when they looked at the, gene chromos the ge genetic uh, sequences, there was no mutation. The, muta the sequences were exactly the same. What happened was the geldenomycin caught an epigenetic change in how the genes were being expressed, and that epigenetic change caused the bulging outgrowth to pass down 13 generations, even though the rest of the generations were not exposed to the antibiotic. Roundworms were fed a particular type of bacteria that, that, that caused them to lose their green fluorescence and have kind of a dumpy look. That passed down 40 generations in the roundworms, even though no DNA sequ sequence change. In other words, get your mind around this. There's no mutation of the DNA happening. Just epigenetic modification based on environmental experience. Subsequent generations were not given the, bac uh, the bacteria. They found that grandfathers who, during their adolescence, grew up in a period of time in which there was very short food supply, in other words, starvation conditions, uh, passed increased risk of dying young to their grandsons and grandmothers to their granddaughters, and they traced this back to an epigenetic change in their either Y or X chromosome. Uh, men who begin smoking before the age of 11 will have epigenetic changes in their Y chromosome that passes on to their sons, increasing the likelihood of obesity in their sons. It doesn't affect the daughters because they don't get the Y chromosome. So they took a, a group of mice, and generation zero, uh, generation zero, they conditioned them with a specific, to fear a specific smell, acetophenone. In the mouse um, olfactory bulb, there is a specific cell that smells and reacts to this smell and nothing else. And they, uh, they have a gene that codes for that particular cell in the uh, olfactory bulb. And so they would expose them to this smell and then immediately hit a loud, a loud really terrifying noise. And so they conditioned the mice to fear that smell. And it wasn't surprising that they had upregulation of this gene, genome gene, so they had more of this particular um, uh, uh, receptor in their olfactory bulb. But what was interesting is that their children, F1 generation, and their grandchildren had less methyl groups. Remember, methyl group locks things down, so removing methyl groups increases expression of this gene, which increased the neural pathway for this in the olfactory bulb, so that these offspring were born afraid of the smell. Even though they weren't conditioned to be afraid of the smell. A form of genetic memory, perhaps. Gestational factors. Women who smoke while pregnant have smaller babies, increased risk of sudden infant death syndrome in their children, more learning and behavior problems in their children, increased psychotic disorders in life than women who don't smoke during pregnancy. That probably doesn't surprise anybody. A recent study of air quality, though, found uh, 40 women and their children were followed for seven to nine years that there was a dose-dependent relationship between polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are the pollution from 
fossil fuels. So when you burn you know, oil and gas and coal, if it gets into the air and you breathe it, um, there's a dose-dependent increase in white matter damage into the uh, left hemisphere of the uh, developing fetus. And this corresponds with increased risk of attention deficit disorder in the child later in life. Alcohol white pregnant increases risk of psychosis. Alco uh, this is interesting. If your mother drank alcohol while she was pregnant with you, it caused an epigenetic change in your taste buds such that alcohol will taste better to you than if she had not drank when she was pregnant with you. Isn't that interesting? Also increases risk of mental retardation, multiple organ defects, of course, fetal alcohol syndrome. But what happens if a woman's pregnant and she drinks one glass of wine or less per week while pregnant? That's all. One glass of wine or less per week. That, that's so little, it's probably not going to really har harm anything, is it? Well, the data shows that those who do that have children who are shorter with smaller heads, more behavior problems later in life, more delinquency, and more emotional problems than mothers who didn't drink at all. Do you remember there is a time in fetal development where 50,000 neurons are being produced per second? Per second. Alcohol impairs those processes. Mother's thinking while pregnant. Certainly what the mother thinks while pregnant is not going to have effect, is it? Study of 4,000 mothers and their children followed for 18 years found that mothers with negative pessim pessimistic depressogenic thought patterns increased the likelihood of their children having depression 18 years later. When they accounted for various other co-founding variables, they found that just the negative depressogenic thinking patterns increased their children's risk of depression by 21%. What if the mother's highly stressed while pregnant? Now, it may not be her fault. Let's be very clear here. It may not be she's got negative patterns of thinking. She could have healthy patterns of thinking. But what happens to a woman? Hey, maybe she's 21 years of age, and she's just gotten married, and she's just gotten pregnant with her first child, and her husband's in the National Guard, gets called up and sent to Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Somalia, into a combat zone. Do you think she'll be stressed? Is it because she's got bad thinking patterns or because it's stressful? How about a young woman gets married and her mother gets diagnosed with some terminal stage of cancer? Will she be stressed? Okay, so stress doesn't mean that somebody has bad coping skills necessarily. Okay, it could be. It could be somebody's really just a stressful person, but it doesn't have to be. It could be just stressful things happen. Nobody's fault. Well, but if the mother's highly stressed during pregnancy, she activates her stress pathways, which activates her stress hormones, glucocorticoids and stress hormones, and those stress hormones will cross the placental barrier. They will cross the developing fetal blood-brain barrier, and they will interfere with the developing breaking mechanism on the fetal brain's stress circuitry. So that the child will be born, and this is repetitive modification, the child, children are born with less capability to calm themselves and turn down their, their anxiety and stress circuits than they would have been had mother not been highly stressed during pregnancy. Epigenetic change, upregulating the activation of their fear and stress circuitry. Now, if that bothers anybody, just remember, no matter where you start, where you're going to discover here, that's, you're born, that's where you start. But there's whole lots of things that are going to influence the brain from that point on, either healthy and calming things down or making things worse. We're going to get that in just a moment. Now, I asked you a moment ago how closely related these two are. What do you think? These are clones, identical twins, in other words. Do they look like identical twins to you? They have the exact same genome. So what's going on? There's one single gene being expressed called the agouti gene. And when that agouti gene is turned on, the, the mouse is obese, blonde, and diabetic. When it's turned off, the mouse is brown, thin, and non-diabetic. What turns on that gene? And, and you notice here different penetrances. So you have some... Some of the genes, some of the cells have the genes turned on here, more here, more here, and complete here. You see the difference? Partial penetrance here. What turns on the gene? Bisphenol A, which is a byproduct of plastic. 
And I put cans here because all your canned foods, all the cans are lined in plastic to keep the acid and other stuff in your canned foods from interacting with the metal. So there's a thin layer of plastic inside your cans. So bisphenol A turns on the agouti gene. What turns off the agouti gene? Methylation. Remember, methyl groups will attach to gene sequences and shut down the gene. So what happened, they took these blonde, obese, diabetic mothers, and while they were pregnant, they gave them a diet that was supplemented with folic acid and B12. Folic acid and B12 are methyl donors. They give away methyl groups. And guess what? The children were born um, with the agouti gene turned off. Mother was blonde, obese, diabetic. The, the children were born brown, non-obese, non non-diabetic. From a dietary change in mother, it, it happened. The methyl group, though, then passed down to the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, three and four generations, even though the rest of the generations were not given B12 and folic acid supplements. Only the first generation was. Do you understand the implications of this? So a mother can make healthy choices today that will not only benefit her children, but her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren, and her great-great-grandchildren, or can go the other direction. Are you thinking of a commandment at all? That the sins are passed down three and four generations? Okay. This is exactly what God is talking about. It's design law stuff. But those who see the imposed law of you, if you sin, God uses his power not only to punish you, but to punish your kids and your grandkids too. That's just, that's just so wrong. This is, this is design law stuff. So in the Netherlands during World War II, there was a severe food shortage, and children um, were born uh, with, uh, with mothers who were averaging about 500 calories a day while pregnant. That's a severe food shortage. And those children um, grew up to have higher rates of obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome than their brothers and sisters from the same biologic parents. And they did genetic sequencing on them, and they discovered there was no gene mutation. But the children who were born during the severe food shortage had 5% less methyl caps on this particular gene. Remember what methyl caps do. Methyl caps shut down genes, right? So if you have 5% less methyl caps, you'll have more expression of this gene, right? Okay? And this gene increases the body's ability to extract energy from food. So they're being born into a world where there's very little energy, very little nutrition, only 500 calories a day, and that environmental signal epigenetically resets their, or sets their genes so they're more likely to be able to survive in a world with, with very poor nutrition. They can extract more energy. But then the war's over, they get normal nutrition, and they're extracting more energy so they have more obesity, more diabetes, more metabolic syndrome hypercholesterolemia, and stuff like that. Mother's uh, intake of mercury and fish oil. A study of 400 children over uh, eight years found that mothers, children of mothers with mercury levels of that one, one microgram per gram had higher rates of ADHD. Shouldn't really surprise anybody. But children of mothers who ate fish twice per week had lower rates of ADHD. Why is that? Well, I, I'm going to just save the reason for that. I'll just tell you, here's the reason... And then we will explain it in our next lecture because we'll, we'll really go into more detail. But it's omega-3 fatty acids. And omega-3 fatty acids are essential for neuronal health. And we'll talk about that in our next lecture because we more about omega-3s. Uh, uh, environmental factors from parents. Animal studies found, now remember, highly stressed mother, child is born, brain is now more susceptible to anxiety, less capable of calming itself than it would have been had mother not been highly stressed. Now they look at the early, early, postnatal period. Pups of nurturing mothers, these were mothers who would lick and groom their pups, were compared to pups of neglect mothers who didn't lick and groom. Not abusive, neglect. What they found is the pups with the attentive mothers had altered brain development such that they had better ability to calm their amygdalas and, were, uh, and those of the neglect mothers had upregulated amygdalas and more social impairment. So, holding a child, comforting a child, touching a child, cuddling a child, kissing a child, all this kind of stuff calms amygdala. Epigenetic changes moving the brain as the brain is developing to be less anxious. 
But they thought, well, wait a minute. Um, maybe the problem here were, was the fact that um, this is genetic to start with. That these neglect mothers have some anxiety problem, genetically predisposed, and they're so stressed they can't be good mothers. And, that, and that's what the neglect pu uh, pups were, were really getting. Not wasn't from the neglect itself. They're just getting bad genes. So they took pups from neglect mothers at birth and put them in with mothers who were attentive mothers who licked and groomed them. And when they did that, the brain development was normal. So it wasn't bad genes for mom. It was bad environmental influence, neglect, upregulating anxiety circuits. First week of postnatal life, rat pups were exposed to abusive mothering, and they found that a particular gene called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, brain-derived means the brain makes it, neurotrophic means it's like fertilizer for the neurons, so this is a protein the brain makes that makes neurons sprout and make new connections and grow stronger. This particular gene was altered in the prefrontal cortex uh, and of the pups whose mothers were... Um, abusive, and they grew up to be poor mothers themselves. The offspring, their offspring of the, of, the mother, of the first generation, so they had offspring, were also born with alterations in this gene expression. Remember, it passes down several generations and also had mothering problems, even though they weren't abused. And if they were taken at birth from the poor mother and raised by a nurturing mother, BDNF partially improved. It didn't completely improve in one generation, but it moved back in the positive direction with good mothering. So 41 Canadian men, 25 were severely abused in their life, 16 uh, controls, not abuse. They uh, examined the DNA expression in the hippocampus of the brains of these individuals, and they found 362 epigenetic changes. Um, some were hypermethylated, some were hypomethylated, but they all had this balance. Those with the abuse had less neural plasticity. In other words, net less ability to adapt and change, make new neurons, make new connections than those without the abuse. This was a very interesting study. It was uh, looking at a 32-year prospective study. Prospective means let's identify the individuals and we will actually follow them for the next 32 years and observe. Oh, I'm glad I didn't do that study. But it was a great study, over 800 individuals, over 800 people, and they uh, took these children and they identified three um, measures of childhood adversity. Overt physical or sexual abuse was one. Severe neglect was another. Severe socioeconomic poverty or deprivation was the third. If you had none of those events, you're represented in the blue bar. If you had one of those events, you were in the green bar. If you had two or three of those, you're in the gray bar. And then they just followed people over the next 32 years. How many people developed depression? If you had none of those events, about 12% of people developed depression. If you had one of those events, 20% of people developed depression. Two of those events or three, 30% of people developed depression. Then they looked and see, to see who had metabolic problems. This would be diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, obesity. And notice, it parallels exactly. 12% with none of the events. 20% with one and 30% with two. And the reason for that is the adversity causes activation of the stress circuitry of your brain, which will, yes, which will activate your immune system, which activates inflammatory cascades, and inflammation over time drives both the metabolic problems that you get and it drives the depression. So the greater the chronic inflammation in your body, the greater the likelihood of both the metabolic problems because the inflammatory cytokines called insulin resistance, and the insulin resistance drives obesity and hypercholesterolemia, and then the inflammatory cytokines make brain changes that drive depression. So, but it all stems from an unregulated, upregulated stress circuitry in the brain that activates the immune system in the body. So childhood stress decreases reward firing. And they looked at uh, stress between kindergarten and third grade, and they found that if children were highly stressed during kindergarten and third grade, it was a predictor of their reward circuitry in their brain being less, um, less active than if they didn't have this at age 26. And this increased the risk for mental health problems later in life, more depression, uh, and less normal reward. So in other words, when good things happen, they didn't get as much joy and happiness out of life and, and a greater risk for substance abuse. Highly stressed during kindergarten to third grade. Adults who are abused as children have higher rates of medical problems, higher rates of mental illness, higher suicide rates, and higher alcohol and drug problems than adults who are not abused. 
Now that's kind of negative. Let's look at a positive. Here's some mice who were engineered, genetically altered, to have memory problems, to be dumb mice. And they took these mice, a group of them, and they took a group of them and put them in an enriched environment for two weeks during their adolescence. And this is what a mouse-enriched environment looks like. Not surprisingly, the, the mice who had, and these are all genetic clones, they're all cloned, had the same defect. The, the group that had the enriched environment had better memory than their, their clones who did not get the enriched environment. That did not surprise people. That, that was expected. But what wasn't expected is when they had offspring, and the offspring were not given the enriched environment, the offspring still had the improved memory. So a positive event, and what happened, there was epigenetic, the environment, the two weeks of this improved environment during their adolescence, epigenetically altered their genes such that it eliminated the, the, the effect of the gene damage that, the, that, that had been engineered in. And thus their kids were born with the bad gene, but their kids were also born with the epigenetic solution for that bad gene such that didn't have the consequence in their life. Isn't that incredible? And what happened specifically is, in this particular case, the environment, the two weeks of adolescent uh, exposure to the uh, better environment, caused um, acetyl groups to attach to the histone region in the area of where that bad gene was that prevented it from being expressed, and so it shut the bad gene down, and they had better memory because of it. Protective factors for kids. They've done, but done multiple studies that show that Children who grow up in a home with a family member confidant. That's a person the child can confide in, talk to, share their heart with without fear of reprisal, without fear of recrimination. Somebody who will accept them, understand them, and love them. Okay? Those students who have a family member confidant have significant better overall development and functioning, um, more likely to succeed at school than children who don't have a family member confidant. And then family cohesion is, in our family, we have each other's back. We don't rat each other out. We don't pick on each other at school. We cover for each other. We protect each other. We have a cohesive, we, we trust each other. We have trust in our family. People who grow up in those families have higher grades in school, more likely to receive um, honors in school, reduce mental health problems, and are more likely to be successful. So both of those family elements um, help resilience in uh, developing children. Other environmental factors, tobacco, alcohol, marijuana. T nicotine binds the receptors that regulate neural development, so teens who smoke, higher rates of psychosis, anxiety and depression, uh, other medical problems, and they epigenetically alter their reward pathways, so they become more physiologically addicted than somebody who smokes later in life. Alcohol, the bottom line on alcohol is the acute effects of alcohol are that they cause a relaxing euphoric effect through altering neuronal membranes, increasing the inflow of ions, which is very acute, happens within minutes of intoxication. That's the relaxing euphoric effect of intoxication. But they all, I'll call, also cause an epigenetic change in the amygdala circuitry, such that when the intoxication phase clears, you actually have an upregulated amygdala that is more anxious which will make you then want to seek some more alcohol to calm yourself again, which will only keep the upregulation so your undercurrent of anxiety increases when you drink. If you stop drinking, that epigenetic change over several weeks will turn back down and, and you'll come back down to your baseline. Marijuana increases the risk of psychotic disorders up to 40%, damages white matter tracts, impairs prefrontal cortex, higher reasoning circuit function, lowers the IQ if you smoke before the age of 18, and those points are never fully recovered. In several, in, in, in one study at Duke, a young adults who smoke daily um, for several years have altered hippocampus. Hippocampus is the part of the brain where new memories take place, thus their memory circuits are impaired and they have impaired learning. RNA in food. MicroRNA, uh, as we talked about earlier, has uh, signaling molecules that alter gene expression. So when you eat food, you not only absorb the carbohydrates, and the proteins and the fats in food, you're also absorbing the genetic material in the food. And as you digest that, there are little microscopic amounts of RNA that get into your body, and that microRNA from food will then epigenetically alter how your genes are being expressed. So plant RNA from food has been found in the blood tissue of people. This, this particular, this is a microRNA from rice. 
and they looked at Chinese subjects who eat a lot of rice, and they could measure this RNA that comes from rice in their bloodstream, and they found that both in humans and in mice, that this particular gene alters the gene in your liver that processes LDL cholesterol. Consequently, uh, decrease LDL um, and, and, and remove, remove it from the plasma. So the point being here is exogenous plant microRNA in food can regulate the expression of target genes in mammals. And so this is well documented, this happens. What's not well documented is what's happening with genetically modified food. There's been no research at all that I've seen anywhere on the genetic expression alterations happening in people who eat genetically modified foods. I'll let you think on that yourself. Media and your child. Uh, babies under the age of one watch approximately one hour of television a day. I don't know exactly how that happens. Uh, seven studies have now confirmed that television watching of any kind before the age of two delays language development. Doesn't matter what kind of television. Educational television, theatrical television, television watching of any kind before the age of two delays language development. American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry all recommend zero television for people under the age of two, for children under the age of two. And then after, um, limits on television watching. Children uh, uh, get greater than six hours of electronic media a day. This is much more than when I grew up. Much more than when I grew up. And it's increasing all the time. When I grew up, we had a television in the house with rabbit ears. Three channels, you had to walk across the room and change. And you could have that UHF one. Sometimes they get like those channels, the little round one on the back. Remember this? Today, and so you had to actually be at home to watch TV. Today, they not only have literally hundreds, if not thousands, of channels, but there's a TV everywhere. TV on the back of the headrest in the booster seat, and the kids like that. TV on their iPad, on their iPhone. Uh, they want every TV in the waiting rooms. Everywhere you go, there's TV. When we went on trips as kids, we had to actually use our imaginations to play games, sing songs. I pick a color of car, and who gets to the, I pick blue, you pick red, who gets to 100 first wins? Okay, we're watching the trap. You know, the games kids play, right? Kids don't do this anymore. We'll come to the dangers of that, what's happening in the brain in just a second. 50% of teens have TV in their bedroom. Best thing you can do for your teen, if you have that, is remove the TV from their bedroom. So impact of television on the brain. Primary impact of theatrical television, notice I'm saying theatrical, not educational, is to activate what we call our lower emotion circuits while simultaneously turning off our higher reasoning circuits. When you watch theatrical television, theatrical television wants to get you to laugh or cry or frustrated or angry or tense and anticipate. They want it, it's still an emotional response and the stronger the emotional response, boy, the better the programming, while simultaneously turning off your thinking. If you think I'm wrong about this, next time you're watching one of your favorite shows, I dare you to think. There is, rare, there is extremely, extremely little programs, it's very, very few programs on TV that I can actually watch. Because when I watch them, they're so stupid. <laughs> For any person who thinks. They're infuriatingly stupid. I, can't, I won't go into them all. There's so many examples. But I, I point them out. I'm with friends who are skiing, and they got the TV on, and they're watching a show, and I, I'll start pointing out. I'll, and they say to me, you're not supposed to. Exactly. In order to enjoy it, you have to suspend activity in your prefrontal cortex. So even before I go into what the studies show, think this through. One of the laws, God's design law, is the law of exertion. If you want something to get stronger, you must exercise it. And if you don't exercise it, you lose it, or you never develop it to start with. So kids growing up with theatrical television, and it's dose-dependent relationship, the more, the worse. 
And you could say in the good things, the more they practice their piano, the better, right? It's the same thing. The more they watch TV, the more they develop their emotion circuits, and the less they develop their prefrontal cortex reasoning and self-restraint circuits. So when they had adolescence and the hormones hit, they're going to be moody, irritable, impulsive, aggressive. They'll act out sexually, act out um, violently, and often turn to substances to calm their emotion circuits because they don't have a prefrontal cortex to do so. Now let me show you the data. Um, first study to really look at this, to see if there's a relationship between violence in society um, and, uh, and, and television watching, was Centerwall's study. It was over 25, year, 25 years ago now, but it's been replicated in several studies, but I love this one. So I re present it, and he looked at three societies, United States, Canada, and South Africa. United States and Canada, television came into these countries in 1945. Television did not come into South Africa at all until 1974. And they looked at a black and white indicator of, hum of um, violence in society, which is homicide rates in society. And they used Canada because Canada has very strict gun control laws, and so if there was an increase in America, they didn't want people to say, yeah, but you got guns everywhere, that's your problem. And in South Africa, they looked at white-on-white -white only homicide to take out the apartheid issues. And what did they discover? From 1945 to 1974, homicide rates in the United States went up 93%. In Canada, they went up 92%. In South Africa, during the same time, they went down 7%. Now, here's the kicker. They looked at homicide rates in South Africa from 1974 to 1987. After the introduction of television, white-on-white -white only homicide jumped 130%. Now, some people say, okay, you watch bad, violent content, you get bad, violent behavior, right? Tell me the TV programming on in the United States between 1945 and 1974. Shout some shows out. I Love Lucy, Leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best. Okay, here's the violent one, guys. Gunsmoke. Now, all of them, including Gunsmoke, get what rating? G-rated programming. G-rated programming increases homicide rates 92 and 93 percent. G-rated programming. Because it's not primarily about the content. Now, did the content get worse after 74? Yes, and so we have a magnifying effect. The content magnifies the problem. You get bad content. But the primary problem is neurobiological developmental. If you exercise emotion circuits, they'll grow stronger. If you suspend activity in your higher cortex, they don't develop. And so you have brains that are less capable of processing impulse and more likely to act out aggressively. The Zimmerman and Christaki in 2007 looked at the same information from a slightly different angle. They, took in, they looked at individuals. They looked at three types of TV. They looked at um, R-rated violent theatrical TV, G-rated nonviolent theatrical TV, and educational TV. And then they measured attention and focus, which is the measure of prefrontal cortex function. And what they found was that both theatrical programming whether it was G-rated nonviolent or R-rated violent, impaired attention and focus, which is prefrontal cortex function, but educational TV did not. So my DVDs are good, guys. And then spiritual influences. Newberg and his group took individuals 65 years of age and older and had them meditate 12 minutes a day on a god of love for 30 days. Before the meditation, they measured the anterior cingulate cortex with MRI scans. That's where you experience empathy, compassion, other-centered love. They took... Um, Measures of heart rate and blood pressure, which is a measure of stress, which is amygdala activation. And they did standardized memory testing. At the end of 30 days, what did they discover? They could measure growth in the anterior cingulate cortex. It was larger on MRI scans. And the way your brain is designed, when your love circuits fire, your anterior cingulate cortex fires, it turns off the amygdala. Love casts out fear neurobiologically. Thus, they had lower heart rates and lower blood pressures. And they had 30% improvement in memory testing all in 30 days. Then I had a group med meditate on an angry God, a punishing God, a distant God. None of these positive changes. You only got the positive changes when you meditate on a God of love. So altruism, uh, which, uh, which is uh, looking at volunteering and helping other people. Adults who volunteered after accounting for variables such as education, baseline health, smoking. Those who volunteer versus those who don't. The volunteers live longer. Less illness, less disability, less depression, less dementia, and stay out of nursing homes longer than those who don't volunteer. Activating, why? 
Volunteerism, helping others, activates love circuits. Love circuits turns off fear circuits. Turning off fear circuits shuts down inflammatory cascades. Reduce inflammatory cascades. You have less metabolic problems, less depression, less dementia. You stay healthier longer. Different prayer, different outcomes. After September 11, 2001, University of Michigan looked at prayer and coping and found that those who prayed regularly had better psychological adjustment one year later than those who did not. But then they looked at um, Muslim refugees from Bosnia and Kosovo. 60% have had PTSD. 77% of these had negative forms of prayer, praying for vengeance on their enemies and God to punish their enemies for what they've done. And what they discovered was the Muslims with the positive prayers, the prayers of forgiveness and grace, had higher levels of optimism and healthy adjustment a year later compared to those with the vengeance prayers. The vengeance prayers, they did not. So it's not simple prayer that matters. It's what you pray and who you pray to. So Jesus said, you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This was an interesting study. Took, and this is uh, individuals with depression before and after cognitive, which is a truth-based cognitive behavioral therapy, truth-based therapy, looking at prefrontal cortex function and amygdala function compared to controls. And so they put them in a functional scanner, and they, while they were in the scanner, gave them a mild stressor, and they showed them a picture of an ugly human face, and they said to them, well, that kind of looks like you, doesn't it? And that was the stressor. And they, they measured the activation of their stress circuits. And you'll see the depressed group, that was quite stressful. The control group and the dotted line, they laughed like you did. It didn't stress them at all. And then the blue line is the depressed group after cognitive therapy. No drugs, cognitive therapy, normalizing activation here. And then they had them do a digit span. They said, take those numbers, put them in order from the lowest to the highest. If you're doing that, you're activating your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex where you reason and think. The control group, nice, robust activation. The depressed group, sluggish. And the depressed group after cognitive therapy. And after cognitive therapy, they have, again, normalization of the brain circuitry because cognitive therapy activates, and when you exercise something, you get stronger. And when you activate the higher cortex, it puts in a calming effect, calming tone on your stress circuitry. So the amygdala calms down. So healthy spirituality helps reduce mental illness because it activates prefrontal cortex and interior cingulate cortex, thereby calming amygdala and lowering inflammatory cascades, thus improving both physical and mental health. Also, altruistic, altruistic activities result in better physical and mental health for the same reason. People with healthy spirituality tend to worry less because they tend to trust God with their outcomes more instead of feeling that everything's on their own shoulders. They tend to live healthier lifestyles and thus reduce oxidative stress on their bodies because they tend to take more care of themselves. They tend to have healthier relationships. They're more likely to forgive and less likely to hold resentment, more likely to repent and seek reconciliation instead of keep hostilities going. So they tend, in general, to have healthier relationships which reduce stress and reduce inflammatory cascades. So healthy spirituality results in a lot of blessings that are physiological in nature to us. So your healthy brain is optimized by having healthy parents, so choose them wisely. And a healthy inner uterine environment. And proper nutrition. And we're going to go into nutrition in our next talk. Um, affectionate, um, responsive parenting, physical activity. Um, stimulate all five of the senses to do, so the brain develops in a balanced way. Avoid toxic substances. Education is very good for developing complex neural circuitry. Uh, limit theatrical entertainment. I'm a realist. I don't think it's, it's realistic that people will not see any theatrical entertainment, but it should be limited. I know uh, and when my son was in his adolescence, we had him keep a log, and for every um, two hours, he did anything other than school. School didn't count, and church didn't count. That was just expected. But his free time, anything, he had to keep a log. He could do anything. He could play basketball. He could play golf. He could play tennis. He could play Monopoly with his friends. It didn't matter. Anything that was not theatrical entertainment, he had to do two hours of that to earn one hour of watching TV. See, neurobiologically, I wanted those other circuits to get more time than the TV. And that was not just TV, too. I also included all electronic media in that. So electronic media. He had to do two hours of other stuff. And he's quite healthy. Adult now, he got grandkids, they're awesome. So, and healthy spirituality altru uh, and al altruistic endeavors. Uh, uh, these, are, these are things that are helping your brain. Resolve guilt and forgive, and forgive people. All righty, so we will stop here and let's uh, take like five to ten. Let's, let's start back at three and we'll do our last talk and then we'll do as many questions and answers as you all want, okay? So three o'clock. Thanks.